Ali, you want to kick us off? <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to just kick you off. Uh, it's funny to hear that bio because I think that's actually an older bio. <laughs> um, <laughs> might have been found on the my public policy page or something along those lines. I am actually Supiak um, and oh. not Yunanga. Um, and I make that distinction because a lot of the times like Yunanga and uh, Supiak are put under the umbrella of Aleut. And so Aleut were the people of the um, Southwest Alaska that were oftentimes like encountered by Russians on the, the Southwest, like Alaska Peninsula, or yeah, the Alaska Peninsula. Um, and we, we just get mixed up a lot of the times. And there's also so much uh, trading routes that happen between like Yunangach and Supiak and Yupik people that a lot of times like our people, like when we came into colonization or when we were colonized, that got uh, erased because of um, this over umbrella term of Aleut. So I personally, like with that specific bio that you just read out, didn't know if I was Yunang you know, or if I was Supiak. And within the last two years, I was able to do a little bit more research and understand that I am actually Supiak. So a little bit of learning for me, a little bit of learning for y'all. Um, and first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Lee, for inviting us to speak here um, under AOA. It's been great because I've been getting to know Lee a little bit more over the course of the last year, um, specifically through my work um, in tourism and kind of like the outdoor industry. And uh, Jen, I'm actually curious to hear, because I don't know if I've ever actually heard how you found out about me, because you reached out to me to interview for a Juicy Bits podcast. And maybe we discussed that, but I might need a little bit of a refresher and then maybe we can launch in from there. Yeah, so hi everyone. Thanks, um, thanks Lee for, for having us here. Um, I'm Jen Gorecki. You almost had it, hard, hard G, but um, it's a, a tricky one. And um, I'm based in Reno, Nevada. Um, <clears throat> how I found you, Denali, I feel like you popped up in my Instagram one day and I was like, who is this? I need to know this person. Like, I was just so taken with you. And I think that I just, I think I DM'd you. I think I um, had a crush and then DM'd you and then you responded back to me. And then you agreed to be on my podcast. So Coalition Snow hosts a podcast. It's called Juicy Bits. It's highly inappropriate. Probably that episode with Denali was like the most um, tempered podcast we've maybe ever had. Um, and that that got it. That got us going. And that would have been that would have been a, a little less than a year ago, right? When we I think it was of like late fall, early winter, 2019, um, when I reached out to you and, and you were a guest on my podcast. And then after that, we just stayed connected. And, and since then have done, like been working on a, on a few things to, together that has sort of culminated to where we are today. Yeah. And I think to add on to that, you know, something that I remember it was during such a crazy time because it was at the beginning of COVID and On the Land was just getting started. And it was amazing because I think Jen really provided a platform for On the Land, which is a podcast that I do, um, which centers Indigenous voices and our relationship to the land to really be elevated um, more so across the industry. So when I think about, you know, the work that the industry, uh, the outdoor industry is trying to do regarding like decolonization and diversity and equity and inclusion I was you know excited by the opportunity to <laughs> be featured on Juicy Bits and I honestly when I did that podcast had not even made the connection that it was with Coalition Snow either and so that was part of my just being in the you know honestly not at a great place at the beginning of COVID and not really like doing my doing my homework but when I realized the work that Coalition Snow was doing in terms of elevating more, um, more women in snow sports and uh, specifically featuring voices of uh, black and indigenous and people of color, um, you know, trans and non-binary folks, it was, I, I was excited that the relationship was already there. And then I got even more excited about all the potentials that could really come out of um, having, a, having a true partnership with Jen. 
So that's a little bit of our origin story. And if you want us to speak um, at all more to coalition or on the land or juicy bits, like please feel free to ask us questions. <laughs> that's a big gloss. Oh, you're muted, Lee. Got it. Um, I, uh, I was also wondering just like um, how you guys, um, uh, at what level you connect on just winter sports in general and um, what led to the creation of this Indi Indigenous Backcountry Scholarship Program? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the way that we connect on that is we both love winter and both love the snow and um, not everybody does. So when you have this like deep passion for it and you can't wait for it to get colder and you want more snow, like a lot of people are waiting for things to warm up. And um, I certainly love the summer and mountain biking is fun, but I, I mean, I just love winter time and just feel more like who I, I feel like myself during the winter. So I think that Denali and I connect um, in, in that, in that way. And the way that we started, you know, working together this winter is that Denali had reached out to me. Well, I am, um, as a fundraiser for Zawadisha, I host um, a, a summit called We Are Changemakers and Denali was on a panel that we had there. And so we sort of reconnected in the fall and um, started talking about publishing magazines because I also published Sisu Magazine, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and so we were chatting about that and in that conversation, um, started to talk about like, well, what would it look like if Denali was an ambassador for coalition and what do our ambassador roles look, look like? And, um, and in that conversation, Denali shared this desire to um, be able to get more indigenous people out into the backcountry. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. And then we did it. And I'll, Denali, I'll let you speak to more of like all the issues and the reason why you wanted um, to do that, but we, we just had this conversation and then true to form for me, I think like the day or two days before I wanted to launch it, I was like, I think we should just do it. Can we just do it? I'm just going to hit send tomorrow. So are you good with this? Like, let's just get started. <laughs> um, I'm not really one to like wait and plan and plan and plan and try to have like the perfection. Cause I feel like you just lose so much time and it's better to just get things out there and have people give you fee feedback on it. So um, we launched the fund, um, the day before um, the holiday that we that is still recognized as Thanksgiving. And the reason why I did that was to start a conversation around how you could have new traditions during that time of year. Um, and that's, you know, to what Denali said earlier, this, you know, one way to try to decolonize the industry and, and just society is like talking about other ways of celebrating various times of years. So that was what happened this fall. Yeah, it's wild to think that it was already in November that it's been launched. <laughs> um, and you'll have to excuse me, I'm calling in actually from the trailhead right now, uh, which is why you are in my my vehicle, which will soon be built out to be in a, an adventure vehicle. Um, <laughs> so I I think both the conversation that goes into, you know, why, why Jen and I are working on this initiative together and then also, and the energy behind it and the initiative itself is very much wrapped into um, like Jen said, a love of snow, a love of being in winter. Uh, when I think about this fund and I think about my love for winter, I think it comes with a little bit of grief, um, mostly because we know that right now we are facing variability in our climate across, across Turtle Island, across the world, and especially here in Alaska. And I'm making the assumption right now that most of the people in this call are actually from Alaska. And, um, you know, I'm calling in from Dina Inna Ithlina or uh, Dina Inna lands here in Anchorage. And I was just on a walk with one of my, one of my friends that I used to work in Denali with. And we were just reflecting on the fact that it is so warm here. You know, I'm out in a leather jacket and a flannel right now, which uh, 10 years ago, that would not have been the case. When I was growing up, even though Anchorage has a more mild climate, it, and I grew up in Fairbanks, um, it, I would still want a heavier jacket. I would still want possibly like, you know, my, my snow pants on and to really be suited up. And so there's like a, a certain level, um, especially as an indigenous person where we understand that winter 
it, it yes it is fun in games to a certain extent but it also isn't it's something to take seriously because our winters are up here they were cold you know there's this convert there's this word that's been being thrown around in uh in the climate crisis that we're currently facing especially when it comes to indigenous people or people of color where they're saying like oh well you're so resilient and you're so resilient well i like to turn that on its head and say yes we're resilient we were resilient way before colonization <laughs> and if you're using resilient in terms of the a racist application it usually means that we've had to be re resilient in response to racist policies that were put in place by the united states government um, i like to turn that on its head and say no i'm resilient because of winter i'm resilient because like negative 60 below made my ancestors know how to create the technologies and and move on the land in such a way that like we didn't freeze to death up here in the north um so that's kind of where this you know a love for for snow and a love for winter and a respect for winter really comes from past that what we've seen in you know the rise of the uh, of snow sports is that Oftentimes snow sports is, it's a, it's a rich man's sport. I grew up knowing that fact. Um, you know, my mom was, she's very much integral to my, my experience um, on skis. She was actually one of uh, a, a few young native kids that were um, brought down to Eliesco when she was young in order to be exposed to snow sports. And she oftentimes talks about the fact that she was not um, she didn't have the best gear, you know, none of the kids had the best gear. They had second down skis, they had second hand, or second hand skis, they had second hand boots, you know, boots maybe that didn't fit right, but they all loved to shred. <laughs> they loved to be on the mountain and they loved to uh, ski their hearts out. And so I, I got on my first pair of skis when I was six and then I got my first pair of skis when I was 15. Um, and that first pair of skis, I was skiing it until I was 22. Um, just until, you know, a couple of years ago and skiing in a pair of boots that were too big that ultimately ended up giving me a bone spur. Um, and what has been amazing to be thinking about, you know, something like the Indigenous Backcountry Fund um, or the Indigenous Ski Fund is that it will allow us to really create not only accessibility of gear, but accessibility to, um, to places to ski and, and really increase education around snow sports as well, which we know that, you know, if you have a backcountry setup, that's only half of it. The other half is what does it mean to use your gear out in the backcountry? And if we've seen anything from this year's uh, snow conditions is that with climate change, there's extreme variability. So more than ever, some kind of avalanche education is absolutely necessary because even if you have that avalanche education the snowpack is just so uncertain <laughs> so how do we make um how do we make snow sports safer how do we make them more accessible and how do we see like more people people of color transgender non-binary folks uh people of varying uh body sizes out on the mountains i just want to add one thing to that too like beyond um like expanding opportunities for indigenous people to find to find joy and and to connect with their land in this way um as somebody who you know i started snowboarding when i was 16 i grew up in arizona and then i moved to lake tahoe and now to reno um there's a mentality of a sort of dominant mentality in snow sports and in um backcountry skiing of like this is my line and I'm not going to talk about where I access this trail or what this route is. And there's a lot of secrecy around it. And I find it fascinating that, you know, honestly, it's predominantly white men who are um, sort of shrouded, you know, trying to own, again, own this, like, like own something that isn't theirs. And so above and beyond, um, you know, what, what this does for indigenous people, I, I hope that the conversations that we have about this scholarship um, educates other people in snow sports to recognize that this land is not yours. It is not yours to own. It is not yours to keep secret. Um, it is not yours to covet in the way that you do. And that there's actually people who've been caring for this land longer than 
you were here and caring for it better and doing it in a way that's community-based and doing it in a way that in this understanding that there is enough for everybody rather than this sort of like white supremacist scarcity I better get mine because there's not enough to go around. And anybody who's been skiing powder the past couple of weeks has felt that <laughs> feeling and it's been really uncomfortable. And um, it's something that I know keeps me away from the outdoors when I start to be a part of that, of that energy. And so I just hope that through this, through this scholarship and just through these conversations that we can be more honest about all of these things and then also try to shift those those feelings and that energy and that and that culture of snow sports that um, has really not been welcoming or um, a place where people want to be unless you you hold the key and there shouldn't even be a key. So um so I think those are um, I mean I just love the points you guys are making. Um, how about mechanically sort of speaking, like what are your roles in the scholarship fund or how are you getting the word out about it? I think you're doing something, Jen, aren't you with um, No Man's Land Film Festival and things like that. So what, what, what are you both, um, what, what roles are you playing there? Yeah, I think, um, I feel like the role that I'm playing and the, in, um, the role that coalition is playing is just, um, as Denali mentioned earlier, as a, a platform, like a way to amplify this. So we had a fundraiser, we, we had a screening of um, No Man's Land Film Festival, I wanna say two weeks ago that we were able to raise a little bit over $2,000 for the scholarship. Um, we partnered with the Patagonia outlet here in Reno to get the, the word out. We have an event tonight um, in the coalition clubhouse. Um, and you know, I've been featuring this in our newsletter and on social, so we're really, a platform for more people to know about it. And then also um, I'm trying to support by helping to um, help the team think of all the different pieces and all the different things that need to go in to actually roll it, roll it out um, without being a decision maker or a, a driver of the outcome, but more um, supporting the back end. Um, and that's that's the role that I've I've been playing. Denali? Yeah, and you know, I really, I think it's been amazing to see the the role that Coalition Snow has been playing in this because a lot of the time, it's it's amazing to see the work that has been done in terms of DEI and decolonization in the outdoor industry uh, over the last few years. And I think we have so many more people that are, you know, starting to pay attention to organizations that are indigenous run or, or BIPOC run, but at the same time, there's still not the same type of visibility as there is for predominantly white organizations. Um, and so being able to just have the the support, um, whether it is that back end support, which is huge. You know, I was telling Jen that I, I very much view her as like a, a informal mentor of mine when it comes to just business creation. <laughs> because I have so much to learn you know we have so much to learn when it comes to to being in this industry and and thinking about the marketing and the strategy and communication strategies and um, on the land is just such a new entity that any kind of any kind of collaboration not only not only do I want it right now but I, I continue to want to have those types of collaborations to really amplify anybody's voice because at the end of the day there's no reason that we need to be doing things individually as organizations or individually as people. Um, I think the only way forward under the climate crisis that we're facing and economic crises and governmental crises, whatever crises we're talking about, is to really have collectives of compassion and collectives of collaboration. Um, and, and so the work that, you know, I'm doing, uh, we're running with, with podcasts, you know, I, I don't know how many people listen to them here, but sometimes you'll hear like a roll and b roll or mid roll and pre roll and these are like the pieces where sometimes people ad, uh, run ads and with on the land i have zero desire to really run your traditional ad that says hey sponsor this company and this brand because we're going to give you 20 percent off if you use our discount code that's not what i that's not a value that i really want to be running on the land with and so if i can say hey, support this fund uh, 
you know, put your money here, put your assets here, put your energy here. And we can amplify that with some of these brands and organizations that I feel like will also be able to benefit ultimately at the end of the day. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure when people will go to the Indigenous Backcountry Fund um, and, you know, click on, click on supporting it, I'm sure they probably spend a little bit of time on the Coalition Snow website as well. So there's an, there's a benefit there for both of us when it comes to thinking about messaging and not thinking about it maybe from more of like a capitalist like standpoint, but more so from like a, well, how do we, how do we share these, this resource that we call money around and not necessarily have the emphasis on the money, but have the emphasis on some of these more like societal outcomes. Um, so that's one of the ways that I'm really thinking about putting it forward and then, you know, speaking to people, speaking in, in places like this lunch on or luncheon, speaking at the, uh, the back in beta event tonight, speaking at the, um, no man's land film festival, you know, those are all great opportunities to not just like get the word out there, but to really have these conversations that I think go beyond the indigenous backcountry fund as well. So I'm, I'm curious, um, what, what has been the reaction so far? Like what kind of feedback are you folks getting? Are you both getting from the field? And then what is, what happens with the fund? Like, how is that, like, how are you choosing how to distribute um, the monies raised? Yeah. Uh the first part of that question again, I heard the second part about distribution. <laughs> yeah, just, just what has been the reception so far? What sorts of um, oh, yeah. reception are you getting? Um, I would be curious actually, Jen, to hear the reception from your point of view with No Man's Land and with Coalition. And I can speak a little bit to distribution. Right now, uh, we just had a meeting yesterday, day before yesterday, um, between Coalition and uh, my, part, my business partner slash friend partner um McKaylee Oliver who's a black country skier or back black foot back country skier <laughs> um and we and then Jalen uh Goff from Native Women's Wilderness and we just talked about the fact uh that we really need to be establishing a advisory council or like a indigenous council to be thinking about where these funds really do go and how they are distributed and that's important because we know that you know, whether you come from a tribe or a region that has access to the mountains, a lot of the times, you know, Jen just mentioned she's originally from Arizona and some parts of Arizona don't necessarily have like deep winter, <laughs> but she's still skiing. And so of course it's very similar in indigenous communities. We might not have people that are you know, we might have somebody that's from the Plains or from a Plains tribe, but if they go out West for some reason and they get experience, like get to experience snow, like how awesome is that, that they want to spend their life in the mountains, even if they didn't necessarily grow up in that region. Um, so we're, we're really thinking about um, how do we, how do we build a team that is from across Turtle Island, um, across different tribal regions to really be able to have this conversation around how to disperse these funds equitably. And then, as I mentioned before, um, we've really been thinking about the accessibility in terms of gear, you know, thinking about transportation. What does it mean to get somebody to like the backcountry areas or what does it mean to like, there's a lot of nitty gritty in that one, I think in particular, which will take some of that like collaboration, I think with other organizations, um, but then really the avalanche uh, education and, and thinking about like these educational opportunities. And right now we're working with Northwest Avalanche Center as well as Alaska Avalanche Center to um, possibly be hosting uh, workshops next year that are affinity course like, um, I'd like both, both hopefully indigenous led, you know, hopefully we can get some indigenous instructors that are airy trained um, to teach these courses. And if not, then creating spaces where indigenous people feel comfortable to take, take these classes um, and then having the scholarship be able to, to cover the funds that it would take to take those courses. I think I just talked in a circle there, but. <laughs> yeah, you, no, you got it, you got it. Um, <laughs> in terms of the, the response, um, you know, the, the community that 
we've been cultivating it. The coalition would, of course, be a community that would be so excited about this, right? So um, from our team of ambassadors and athletes to our partners, say, Patagonia um, or, um, you know, some of the, like, we work with Bold Brew P PR, um, everyone's just really excited. We even, we're starting to have some people reach out to us and want to support the fund above and beyond an individual contribution that people can make on the Coalition Snow web website. Um, I would imagine though that, you know, as this conversation grows, there certainly will be people in snow sports who might actually say out loud, who gives a shit and why are we doing this? Like <laughs> that doesn't, if that were to happen, I would be frustrated and not surprised. Um, but I, um, yeah, so, so far the, the response has been incredible and, and we're just seeing lots of, lots of people just give, um, you know, one of the nice things about having it on the Coalition Snow website is that it pops up for a lot of people when they're doing their existing shopping. So we see a lot of add-ons, even if it's like $5 or 10, we're seeing that being um, added in into carts and into existing orders. And um, people are just really, um, they understand it. They understand the, the need for it and the rationale behind it and are just really excited to be able to support it. And I hope that as, as it grows and as we tell, you know, tell this, story more and, and to more to a broader audience that that reception continues to be um, positive. But sometimes I'm just super jaded because I've been in this industry for too long and, you know, just try to temper my feelings, my emotions sometimes. Well, you know, that's actually um, a great segue to, to another question I've got for you both. Um, uh, so you both have a vision for, um, for the out, for, for the, and a, a mission and a vision and a drive to see change. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how you imagine the, uh, outdoor recreation economy in the next five to 10 years. Well, <laughs> Lay it this out there, girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is probably like one of my, yeah, one of my favorite questions because I love imagining futures. And I think if there's anything that COVID has gifted us with, it's like this opportunity to just like imagine different realities that maybe people didn't even think that they had the opportunity to do. And of course, there's, there's a lot of privilege with it, even in saying that, you know, who has time to be imagining futures. Uh, but I think within, everybody has the opportunity to dream, whether or not we have the opportunity to execute on it. So how do we make the execution possible for everybody? Um, and I think that that's really where it, even speaking to this imagining futures is is powerful because then it says like let's have this conversation let's really dream and scheme together um and this really this question really wraps into you know some of the work that I feel like we're doing Lee and I'm trying to like bring into the uh AOA the Alaska Outdoor Alliance conversations um you know a lot of my background has to do with the intersections of tourism, um, the academy, and then government. <laughs> so public policy. And I, I, at the end of the day, wholeheartedly believe in land back as a policy. And what that means not necessarily is like, hey, all non-Native people get off these lands. It doesn't mean that at all. Land back is a policy that can be set in motion to have our lands managed by us as Indigenous people through co-management strategies. So if you think about National Park Service, if you think about the Borough of Land Management, if you think about um, state, <laughs> state-run parks, each one of these places and spaces has the opportunity to really be, come under a co-management strategy where tribes are saying, we've had a millennia-long relationship to this plot of land. We know what the trees need. We know the animals that exist here. And of course that's all changing. We also like in a lot of ways as indigenous people have a lot to learn because we've been so separated from our lands. And so what does it mean for us to learn together in order to really 
not continue legacies of wilderness, which pretty much negate any kind of native people's uh, narratives or, or stories and relationships to the land, but really say, all right, here's this piece of land. We understand that we are part of the ecosystem rather than just being, um, sorry, I just saw a question. I'll answer that in a second. Rather than just being in this hierarchy of it, we are part of the ecosystem. So where do we as humans with our built environment, so our our trails, our roads, our buildings, where do those fit in rather than where do they dominate? Um, so I, I would really just love to see more of a conver conversation around co-management. And honestly, I see like something like the Indigenous Backcountry Fund as being that foot in the door of saying, all right, if we have more native people that are skiing on the mountains, if we're able to go out and see our own lands in the backcountry, if we are then able to step into these education positions where we're teaching avalanche courses or whatnot, then we're able to instruct on our own lands. If we're able to instruct on our own lands, some of our own knowledge, because that's not gonna, it's not just gonna look like, all right, here's the levels of snow. <laughs> here's the layers of snow. It's also gonna look like that peak over there is named Denali <laughs> or that peak over there is named XYZ or to, you know, Tacoma, um, thinking about Mount Rainier. And there's, a, there's this entire story that tells you a worldview. So what does it mean to have a more indigenous worldview that can be implemented through co-management and through some of these programs that we already have, such as the interpretive programs at national parks? You know, as you mentioned, Lee, I was a, a, a interpreter, a cultural interpreter in Denali National Park for a few years, and I was one of five native people in that park. What would it mean for that park to actually be run by our own native people? That would be amazing because then we wouldn't just be in those tokenized positions of being like a cultural interpreter. We would be the people that are driving the buses. We'd be the people that are like feeding you food at the restaurant <laughs> um, and hopefully food from the land. So it's, there's a lot of different components into it. And if you want to know more, and I'm going to put a little pitch in here, um, get in touch with the Alaska um, climate Alliance. We're doing a lot of regenerative economies work right now, and it really is inclusive. And there's this huge overlap between, you know, regenerative economies, just transition work and the outdoor recreation work that we're trying to do right now. And they need to be in con like they need to be in contact because silos are part of the reasons that they are. Just the way you're sitting, but you're really I'm going to jump in uh, while Denali <laughs> manages. Or, you back? Yeah, I'm back. Apparently, my back tire is flat. So <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, feel free to jump, jump in, Jen. And then I want to answer that question. I can answer that question later. Well, you can answer it now. OK. Um, so the academy is not anything like crazy. I was. I went to school at Brown University. And so my uh, educational background and my network, my like societal network and social capital is very much connected to like the Ivy League institutions. So I'm very invested in decolonizing the Ivy League institutions as these institutions, which have kind of like a trickle down to, a, you know, your basic community college. And so there's an entire decolonization process that has to go in to those institutions so that we have curriculum that is uh, more responsive across the board, whether it's K-12 um, or higher ed to really um, change the narrative of this country. Well, that was something else that you and I connected over, Denali, I think that first time um, when you were on the podcast, because I dropped out of my PhD. So we had this conversation around the academy and like, who creates knowledge and how do you create knowledge and who and who is it for and what is it doing? And so um, we've certainly connected around that as well. Um, for me that, you know, what the, the future, you know, what, what my vision is for the net, you know, in 10 years, I would just love to see that these conversations like the ones that we're having today um, are just, the most normal thing that you'd ever have in the outdoor industry. Um, what is normal has never served us. It served a, 
a group of humans, we know who those humans are, serve them quite well, both like across the society in the outdoor industry. It wasn't even until I'd say eight years ago, 10 years ago, that there was even this conversation around women. And by women, we know that also is white women. We know that was the conversation. And so here we have the snow sports industry that's making strides um, because now they have like a handful of white women on their Instagram and um, they might be competing and, 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 and they're good. Thank you for acknowledging our existence and working on things. And still there's so much more, there's so much more out there and, and um, these concepts to wrap your mind around and, and humans to embrace and ideas to embrace. And I think that um, snow sports in particular is really slow to catch on to these things. I think the outdoor industry um, as a larger umbrella over snow sports is um, a bit more in tune with the change that we're seeing across the world and the change that needs to happen. And I would just like, you know, in 10 years, I would like to be in this industry and feel sati satiated by the conversations and the people who I'm surrounded by. I'd like to feel like there's this um, incredible progress and in, in movement and um, collaboration. I would just like to feel differently. I'd like to see other people. Um, and I, I, I certainly think there's lots of people who are working to make that happen. And I would like for all of it to move from the margins where it is today and move into the center. And that's really what my vision is for 10. I mean, I'd also be okay with this if it happened tomorrow. I don't have to wait 10 years. So like we could just make it happen tomorrow, but you know, it's gonna take some time. So we'll just hang in there. Oh, you're still muted. Can't hear you. I've got, um, I'm really near, um, for those of you in Anchorage Lake Hood and the little gnat sounds of the airplanes going by, I'm trying to mute that out. But um, anyway, so um, we've got some great people in the audience and I'd like to give them a chance to ask either or both of you a question. So um, I'm gonna switch to myself to gallery view. And um, if anyone has some questions, can you just um, either raise a hand or um, just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and join this conversation. Um, how about anything you, you all are doing? Um, go ahead, Haley. I was just sitting there idiotically trying to find how to raise a hand. And then I was like, well, I have one. I'll just raise this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I would love to know, like, what are some tangible action items for people in this room today? Um, especially many of us are looking at names. I think a lot of us are in the Alaska area. Um, for what we can do to be helpful. Like, do you, do you want folks calling AMH and making them, you know, contribute skis and money into this scholarship? Do you want like, what, what can, what are some steps we can all take after this meeting is over? Oof, I always love this question. And Jen, maybe we could just riff off of each other here. <laughs> Cause I think, you know, there's, there's, and I, I say I always love this question because it always kind of makes me cringe a little bit if I'm being honest because I'm always just like oh oh there's so much to do <laughs> where do we get you started at um you know I think first and foremost at the very basic like decal level if you want to know more about like decolonization DEI work there's plenty of podcasts out there whether it's Juicy Bits or On the Land or um, or she explores features a lot of different um, women and non-binary folks in the outdoor industry. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of answers out there by many other people besides myself and Jen that would really be able to say, here's, you know, here are some things for you to think about and really be starting to engage in, in, in some of these larger conversations. Um, I think in terms of the Indigenous Backcountry Fund, you know, contribute to the fund 101. <laughs> we 
would be great. Um, I think as we start to release more, you know, marketing and, and com- like mission statements around it or any kind of stuff around it, like sharing that and amplifying it is always a great step too. And that's part of what I wanted to say a little bit ago is like, we're in this for the long game. We're not in it for the short game. And that was one of the conversations that Jen and McKaylee and Jalen and I just had too. It's like, we don't feel like we necessarily have to disperse the funds, you know, this season because we're already in March or almost March. Um, Like we're looking at next year. We're looking at 2023. We're looking at 2024. We're thinking about how do we really make this something that's like sustainable for the long term. Um, so I think that's what I that's what I got right now. And if you want to call AMH and ask them to donate or ask them to amplify, that would be amazing. <laughs> AMH Jen is a they're Alaska mountaineering and hiking and hiking. Thank you. <laughs> and they're great. Like they're a great resource here, and a lot of people really respect them as a small business in Alaska. Yeah, I think it. Um, other things to do. I mean, definitely connecting with brands or businesses individuals, just anybody who would want to contribute to the fund, um, whether that's like gear or monetarily would be really help helpful. Um, also just spreading the word about it. I think also um, when I say we, I'm going to use the word we, and by we, I mean white women. I think we can support this by making these conversations part of our daily lives. And I think we can um, hold the people around us accountable for having these types of conversations. Um, And for me, holding people accountable, there's nothing negative about it. There's, you know, no finger wagging. It's actually really exciting, engaging conversations with people that I can't wait. Like, this is all I want to talk about. And then I also find out really fast who's not going to be my friend because they're like, I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore, Jen. And I'm like, okay, we're just not compatible. But so like, I feel like I get to surround myself with the most amazing people because we get to have these types of conversations all all the time. Um, something that I've been asking of, of white men, <clears throat> um, some are really keen on it, others not necessarily, is um, I'd like to see white men holding each other accountable. And, um, you know, if you're out on a tour and somebody uses some sort of language that's aggressive or doesn't want to share knowledge or just all of the things that we know that goes on, just say something about it. Like say something to your friend, hold your friends accountable for creating more inclusive and welcoming spaces. I feel like so much of the, of the, the work um, is placed on the, placed on the backs of the, of the people who are, the recipients of the pain versus the people who are actually inflicting it. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for um, white men to step into, um, to step into really nurturing supportive roles um, that actually just make the outdoors and this world even a better place for them too. So I just, I'd like to see that. Great. Uh and I'll, I'll take on one thing that just came up for me uh, while you're speaking, Jen, and that is like, and it goes to the, the conversation around AMH is, you know, if you're involved, if you have intimate relationships with other businesses here in Alaska or other organizations, you know, mention, mention the backcountry fund, mention some of these other, mention Coalition Snow as like a leader in the industry that is doing some of this critical DEI work. Um, and, and just say, hey, we want to see you support the Indigenous Backcountry Fund because you as a buyer or you as a user or you as a, a participant or partner, whatever, whatever you are to some of these organizations, especially, especially small businesses, if we can, if we can come together as small businesses, like that is just a whole nother level of coalition building and, and really empowering one another that we have the opportunity to do right now. And we need to do if we're going to have sustainable economies that do not just benefit large corporations. And if you're a large corporation, Hey, you know where to find us in order to do some of the critical work. (laughs) Um, Hey, um, I know my friend Maeve has a question for you ladies. Maeve, um, go ahead and take the, take the microphone. Thanks Lee. Um, I just want to say 
Well, first of all, thank you um, both, both to Denali and to um, Jennifer. Uh, I actually ski on your skis, Jen, and you were so kind. You personally wrote me a couple years ago and I was broke and you helped me find a, an affordable set of brand new ones. And it's been a great tool for me to use your skis because um, people ask what they are and they love the graphics and then I can tell a story. And so that's been really exciting. Um, and uh, I professionally, I work for the local government in the Parks and Rec world. And then my nonprofit work is in the outdoor industry and whether it's working with ski resorts or it's working, I'm on a, a board for a local nonprofit ski area here um, called Arctic Valley. And um, I do, I used to do a lot of avalanche stuff. And um, one thing that I'm struggling with in um, current times is the topic of DEI is up. We, I've been able to even myself bring it up, but my, my co-board members or my co-leaders of these projects are, you know, the conversation's happening. And even as a designer, designs are happening, but the people are missing from the room. And it keeps being said, you know, and I can sit there and kick and scream and say, oh yeah, we're gonna do another park design and we're gonna honor indigenous people. And um, where were they at the beginning? And they haven't been here through this entire process. And we are literally on Denina land right here in downtown Anchorage. And um, I'm just wondering, we're pretty far into this process now where I think tools are starting to get established. I'm wondering if either of you have any advice for um, helping me professionally to bridge that gap and to get more inclusivity at the table um, without, without actually quitting and throwing a complete temper tantrum. <laughs> um. Prior, prior to my work at Coalition Snow, I worked in um, outdoor ed and I worked primarily in the Central Valley of, of California um, and a lot with the indigenous communities there um, and the Latino community. And one of the things that we worked on really closely with the National Park was this idea of um, you need to go to people versus having people come to you. And so perhaps one way of looking at it is that, yes, you're all in the room having the conversation, but why, why y'all in that room, right? Yeah. So like perhaps the conversations and the things that you're doing need to leave that room and go somewhere else because it, there's can just be a lot of reasons why other, why, why people maybe aren't walking through your door, even though you want them there. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why they may not come through that door. So what are the ways that you can have those conversations expand outside of that room and, and you all get, get out and go, like either physically or metaphor, like whatever it is, there might actually be a physical movement that happens. That might be one way to approach it. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I was just, this is just something that's off the top of my head. I mean, launch a like BIPOC ski free day. <laughs> Love that. Yes. Yes. Have more people like at the mountain and you know, I'm sure that there would be relationships and maybe not right away, but eventually, you know, one of the things that is really great about some of the climbing gyms that are happening down in the lower 48, and I'm trying to get uh, Alaska Rock Gym to do here, uh, is they have, you know, BIPOC climbing nights, and those are fantastic. And they not only allow you to, like, start to build those relationships holistically, but it also is a space where then we can just be on the mountain without having to worry about any of the other stuff that oftentimes can come, meaning racism, um, <laughs> like on the mountain or in the gym or at the crag. Uh, so that's something, and if you want to talk more about that, I would be more than happy to set up a, a skiing day at Arctic Valley. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, and then the other thing, I don't know if you've reached out to like any of the Alaska Native corporations or to the tribes. I know that there's the, uh, Eklutna tribe is mm -hmm. here um, in Dena'ina lands. And so you can reach out to Eklutna, but again, just be careful of, you know, how much you're asking and how much you're putting on our own organizations uh, without doing that initial work of maybe going to some of those other rooms like Jen just mentioned. I love it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, we've got um, two more questions for you and they'll probably be uh, running slim on time, but um, Eva, uh, go ahead and, um, and let us know what's on your mind. Hey, thank you for uh, providing this uh, great uh, seminar. And um, I'm kind of hailing in, first of all, I'm in academia here in Alaska. 
uh, and I work at Alaska Pacific University. And we, we have set our mission as uh, pro welcoming um, all the students from all around Alaska and providing opportunities for that. So that's why I'm here. And I'm also in the outdoor studies department. So outdoor recreation and making it accessible and welcoming for everybody is, is part of my mission. Uh, but in addition, why I'm right now uh, asking question for you is, um, I'm also in the, in the board of the American Avalanche Association. And uh, that's a totally white male uh, industry. And we did a, a industry census work last year and figured out that there is like 1% of the membership or people who uh, identify themselves as avalanche professionals uh, are from other ethnic groups or BIPOC or anything like that. So we recognize that as an industry that that's very difficult. Gender is a little different. We have more and more women and actually here in Alaska, we have a lot of really great female role models that are like pioneers in this, in avalanche, avalanche work. So we're kind of cool that way. It's not that odd thing for us to see, but it is more about ethnicity and seeing brown and black skiers because becoming an avalanche professional takes that you have the time to cultivate your skill set. It's not like we can just recruit people even if we'd want to have DEI work done. So I'm looking at organizations like yours, like you are the key. So how do you make, see this long-term happening where you can actually see a decade from here from somebody who goes to coalition snow, indigenous backcountry uh, avalanche course, and then has a vision for themselves that they could actually become professional in this world and become even more of a role model. So do you have some ideas? Yeah, let's work together. <laughs> I think is my first idea um, because that's fantastic. And, you know, we have uh, one of our friends, he just took his uh, pro two, I believe, right, Jen, or pro, pro one. And, you know, he's looking at becoming a guide. I would love to become a guide and a professional to be able to teach other people. So I think there's 100% the desire there. And if there's the desire at the institutional level to really be amplifying and creating professionals in this field, then let's do it. Let's figure out some way. And if this fund can start to begin to, um, you know, supply people with the, the avenues for that to happen, whether it's opening up those conversations or getting people on their first setup at the, you know, at a young age or at whatever age, then I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> and that's just, I'm really glad that you're on this call. So thank you so much for joining. And Lee, thank you for opening up this space because I did not know who was in the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah this I have a question from, uh, from Kevin Keeler. Um, Kevin, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and, and make your comment or question. Can we, sure, can we um, oh. uh, real quick to that last question, please, oh, just because I'm curious to hear her response. Oh, I just wanted, I just wanted to add that that is that, that using part of the funds to support people in getting their um, certifications and credentials to be guides and instructors um, in the field is, is one way that we're going to use those, those funds. So the more money that the fund has, the more people who can be supported in getting those necessary certifications. And then also I would encourage anybody who is a decision maker at any of those institutions to think about how do you make those opportunities actually accessible to people? If, if, you, if you want diversity, it doesn't happen just because you want it. You actually, like, there's a whole lot to be said for um, actually putting money and resources into it so that you get what you want. It's not a giveaway. It's not, ch not charity. It gets you what you want and it makes it better for everybody. So thanks. And Kevin, I know you have a question, so go get Kevin. Anyway, um, so I'm Kevin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, one of the jobs that I do is I'm the federal coordinator for the Iditarod National Historic Trail, which is a thousand mile mega transect across Alaska from Seward to Nome. Probably 800 miles of it is across wild lands, roadless country, um, mainly populated by the native people who originated here. One, one of the things that I've observed 
and that we don't get when we're in our own little bubble of the cash economy is that the recreation that we participate in, the whole paradigm is based on the cash economy. When you go out in the bush, people are not necessarily, uh, you know, recreation as we understand it uh, exists, but it exists very differently. And um, I notice this because there's this whole aspect about volunteerism um, out in the bush that's real different. Basically, you participate as a volunteer when you've got time and money, you've got time, uh, money already and resources to do things. It's a very different situation in Bush, Alaska. Um, most of our communities out there, folks are um, so under-resourced that they can't even get out and experience, for instance, shelter cabins that are along the trail. I'd like to set up a program that would do that, uh, get them out to these places, get to learn and engage in the countryside you're talking about. So I'm wondering what, if you've thought about this, how do you engage people in this quote unquote recreation when they're not necessarily in the cash economy or they're not on Maslow's hierarchy even to the point to participate in recreation the way we talk about it here. <laughs> and we don't, <laughs> that's just an opening of this question. Uh, if, if it takes a long time to answer this like years, that's fine with me. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it's definitely a much longer conversation that has to do with equity in general, especially in a state that does not value uh, indigenous people. Um, you know, you very much are in, as Dunleavy likes to call it, a uh, the nation's warehouse. So when it comes to the extractive industries here, they do not feed indigenous people. And most of the time, our lands are being uh, extracted from, and most of that money is going down to the lower 48. So if you think about the oil industry, if you think about the fisheries industry, um, which I'm also a commercial fisherwoman in the summertime, um, then first of all, we need to be addressing those industries. So it's a, it's a much larger conversation. I think that Iditarod definitely plays a, you know, could play a crucial part in the narrative around what does recreation mean? Um, one thing that we see with Iditarod in general is like, we don't even have a lot of our own people as native people participating in the Iditarod even more, even though the mushing industry or the mushing is a sport that is from the North, that is from our people. Um, I'm originally from Anvik. I forgot to say that in my introduction. And so Anvik is one of the villages that is on the Iditarod Trail every other year. And we have, um, I mean, I can go into a whole entire conversation around the economy of the rural areas, but that is that is definitely something that we are thinking about. You know, I would not have been exposed to skiing if I, if my mom didn't raise me predominantly in Fairbanks. So I, I really appreciate your question because it very much speaks to the larger inequities that are at play across Indian country or across native country that we have to be thinking about, not only with this fund, but um, in the industry at large, because a lot of times if you're, if you're based in Anchorage, you might not even be thinking about the fact that, you know, you have access to the Chugach mountains and trail systems here in Midtown Anchorage or whatever it is. Um, and, and like you said, a lot of the times non-native people are able to access our lands, whether it's due to the fact that they have a new jet boat that can get down rivers that don't have enough water in them anymore because we're experiencing like lack of water due to rising temperatures in the Arctic um, or, you know, <laughs> or people can't go out and get like moose and salmon in the same way. So like you said, there are much larger conversations at play. I think the important part to keep in mind is that recreation, whether is um, fishing or hunting or skiing or uh, hiking or any of these things, we tend, like the Western economy tends to silo those out. They tend to break them up. But we as indigenous people have a relationship to the land that is so much like, it's so intrinsic to our being that if we go hiking out to a berry patch, that is hiking, even if it's not recognized as hiking by the hiking industry. Um, and so first I just wanna like break down that silo. <laughs> and, and, then, and then two, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I just don't have all the answers right now, but um, you're, you're speaking to the larger equity issues. And uh, 
I encourage you to tune into to on the land because that's kind of what we're tackling as as a podcast. That's what I'm tackling in my podcast. Um, and if you would like to speak to how the Iditarod can really help with that narrative, then let's have that conversation. Well, just to be clear, I represent or involved with the National Historic Trail, which is like okay. a, the Pony Express Santa Fe, although the event, these contemporary events do take place on it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's more than just the sled dog race, w way more, fortunately. I <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and um, the, you know, the Anvik Historical Society is actually, my, my grandfather has asked me personally because of my background in anthropology, which is what I have my degree in, to really be uh, working on revamping the historical society in, in Anvik. Um, so that's another conversation, but. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's happening. Um, Jen, did you have any thoughts or, or, or closing ideas you wanted to share? I mean, just everything that Denali said, it all comes back to equity. That's, yeah. that is the answer. And that's going to, that's a lot. It's a lot of conversations and work to be done around that. All right. Well, um, uh, in the interest of time um, and, and people's busy schedules, I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who attended and especially to Jen and Denali. Um, for leading a really um, provocative session, I think, thought-provoking and um, insightful and, and inspiring um, lunch and learn for us. So thank you for both, thanks to both of you for your time. I want to remind everybody that um, Alaska Outdoor Alliance is on the web at um, alaskaoutdooralliance.org, um, on Facebook. Um, next week, um, we have... Um, uh, please join us next week. It's a great follow-up to this conversation. Um, we're going to have Protect Our Winters is presenting um, um, uh, Bristol Bay um, uh, pro snowboarder, Callan, um, and I, I murder her last name, so I'm going to apologize in advance, but she's a pro snorter, snowboarder, and she's kind of like Prince. I think everybody knows her by Callan anyway, um, but um, so she's going to be with us next week, and, um, and I'd, I'd encourage everybody to join us again. We'll be talking more about climate change and how it intersects with outdoor recreation. Thanks again, and um, everybody have a great day. Think equity, take action, donate to the um, scholarship fund. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> Talk to you later. All right.